Um, for an introduction, I was, you know, they tell you when you speak, you got to have like a good introduction. So last night in my kitchen, my dog seemed to like this introduction. I asked my dog last night, he raised a paw. I said to him, hey, have you ever heard the country song, Jesus, Take the Wheel? Have you heard this song? Oh, it's an old song, Jesus, Take the Wheel. Cars skidding in the ice, the girl, Jesus, take the wheel. I wrote this down. I actually went in my office last night and wrote a Selah that will be on next month in Selah. Uh, here's what I wrote. Sometimes Jesus doesn't want to take the wheel. Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus is like, no, I ain't touching the wheel. Now, I believe that if you're in a panic situation, if you're in a storm and ice on the road, I think Jesus can take the wheel. But I think the normal process of Christianity is that Jesus doesn't want to take the wheel. He wants you and me to learn how to drive. He wants you and I to learn how to navigate life's ups and downs, twists and turns. And he wants us to have our hands firmly on the wheel, making conscious decisions that say, you know what? I will praise him. I will bless his name. I will keep going to church. I'm going to keep reading my Bible. I'm going to drive my life all the way to glory. I'm not going to look back. I'm going to look forward. Paul said, I'm going to press on towards the prize. I think sometimes in the American church culture, there's this stance of Jesus, take the wheel. I don't, whatever you want, Lord. I've heard Christians say, I actually asked a woman a little while ago in church, said, well, you know, what's your plan? What's your, and she said, well, you know, Pastor, I'm just clinging to that promise. Que sera, sera. I said, what? And she said, you know, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. I said, you realize that's a Doris Day song, not a Bible verse. What? What? She said, I heard someone say it in church. Uh, there's too many Christians that are just kind of going through life with, well, Jesus, take the wheel. You know, wherever we end up is where he wants us to end up. Uh, not so. God wants you to drive. God wants you to step on the gas, have the right heart, the right attitude, and get to where he wants us to get. Amen. Would you say amen? amen? So stop saying, Jesus, take the wheel. Learn to say this, Jesus, I got the wheel. With your help and your power, your strength in me, God, we'll get through this. We know what to do. We have his word. We have his wisdom. We have the mind of Christ. Don't let go. Keep driving. Don't give up. Some people let go. They think Jesus is going to take the wheel. He doesn't. Then they crash. Why did I crash? Jesus, I said take the wheel. Jesus said, I told you, I ain't touching the wheel. <laughs> you crash. Why did we crash? Because you let go of the wheel. Don't let go. Turn to the person next to you and say, don't let go. Don't let go. Just hold on. Don't let go. Today's message, the first one in this series, is entitled, Gratitude Generates Generosity. Gratitude generates generosity. If we can learn to have a, an attitude uh, that is filled with gratitude in spite of what is happening. I'm, I'm not one of those preachers. I'm not a TV preacher. I never will be one. I'm, I'm, I'm not politically correct enough. We get in trouble now with just live stream. Uh, <laughs> it's, listen, if you want to get rid of half the people you've got to buy Christmas presents for, just put something on Facebook. You'll, you'll lose half your friends, I'm telling you. It's easy. I get rid of half the people. I do it intentionally the month before Christmas. <laughs> i show you what I mean. About halfway through the sermon, I'll say something. You'll go, oh, I know what he means. Now I know he's nuts. Uh, listen. A few things. Take a quick picture. Listen, when we express our gratitude to God, the more attuned our minds become at noticing other blessings and the happier we become. The more we express our gratitude, thank you, Father. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. God is good to me. The more we express our gratitude, the more attuned, the more tuned in our minds become to other blessings. Expressed gratitude confers, it's an old word, but it, it gives regard and respect to the event, to the blessing, changing how we actually experience life and the world around us. Expressed gratitude. Now, there are some people that say they have gratitude. They're those people that when you hold the door open for them, they just walk through. Does that drive you nuts or does that drive you nuts? My wife gets mad at me because when I hold the door open for people, they walk through. I tend, when they're about five yards by, to go, you're welcome. <laughs> My wife says, you shouldn't say that. It's rude. And I'm like, uh, I don't think I'm rude. I think they're rude. I think I opened the door for them. They didn't have the common decency to say, thank you for holding the door open. 
You're welcome. <laughs> you think I work here? What? <laughs> Expressed gratitude. We, we, someone joked years ago, they said the garbage cans at Burger King and McDonald's have more gratitude because at least on the front of it, it says thank you. You know, even the garbage can says, thank you. No, so we, can't, we can't even, someone open the thank you. Say thank you. At the heart of our relationship with God is gratitude. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says this, rejoice always and delight in your faith. By, be unceasing and persistent in prayer. In every situation, no matter what the circumstances, be thankful and continually give thanks to God. For this is actually the will of God for you and I in Christ Jesus. What's the will of God? That we should pray about everything. We should uh, be unceasing and persistent in our prayer. That we should delight in our faith. Christians ought to be the happiest people on the face of the earth. You ought to go around with a stupid grin on your face. Just smile at people. They'll ask you why. I don't think that when you go in a restaurant or when you go in a store or anywhere you go... People ought to leave, and, and, and they think, well, I'm glad he's gone. My wife and I were in Target the other day. I don't, I don't go to Target much. My wife calls it Target. I don't know what that means, but we were in Target. We had the grandkids, and if you ask my grandkids where they want to go, I said, you want to go to the park? Do you want to go to the swings? You want, Papa, let's go to Target. <laughs> and they make a beeline for the toy department, and so I said, well, just one toy today, and Brody says, one toy each, and I said, okay, one toy each. This is how clever this kid is. So we bought two toys, and he said, hold on, Papa, we didn't get one for you and Noni yet. <laughs> I said, well, I don't know if Papa wants anything. Yeah, you do, Papa. You want some new Legos. You need some new Legos, Papa. You need a new Lego. So we bought four, and then a couple more, and then a couple more, and we got down to the checkout stand, and the basket was pretty full. Grandpa gets a little, Papa gets a little carried away, and we had this thing full, and, and, and the girl behind the counter, she looked a little down. She looked a little sad, and we came around the corner, and she said, yeah, come on, come on, I'm, I'm open. And I said, no, 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 you don't look open. <laughs> she said, I do, my light's on. I said, no, I don't think your light's on. <laughs> she said, no, no, it's on. I said, I'm not talking about that light. What, what, what light? What? I said, the light inside. Oh, well... You know, I, I've been working, it's a long shift. I said, I know. And everybody's probably driving you crazy. People are just nuts, aren't they? She said, yes. I said, you ain't seen nothing yet, honey. Hold on. <laughs> I started unpiling stuff, and we started singing Christmas songs. And she said, is all this for Christmas? I said, no, this is for today. We're going home and opening all this today. <laughs> she said, what are you going to do for Christmas? I said, I don't know. <laughs> But we laughed, we had some fun, and then we paid, and my credit card went through. I was like, yes. <laughs> and just before we left, I, I said, listen, I want you to know something. I said, I said, the Lord sent me here today just to cheer you up. And I said, God wants you to know that he loves you, and even when you're having a hard day, you can call on him. Yeah. She looked at me, and she said, well, 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 thank you. Thank you. I said, you're welcome. Do I get a company discount? Do I get anything? <laughs> Do you delight in your faith? I got to quit messing around and preach this. Do you delight in your faith? Are, are you a happy person or are you miserable? <clears throat> oh, look what's happening in the world. I don't know what we're going to do. Stop. Everybody's posting crazy stuff. Post something positive. Yeah. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I'll get to this. You realize, write this down. The number one thing the devil wants to steal from you is your joy. It's not your money. It's not your time. It's not your talent. It's your joy. I'll tell you why. Because the Bible says the joy of the Lord is my strength. And the devil knows if he can rob you of your joy, he can rob you of your strength. So you need some joy. My job today is to give you a little shot of joy. I got some. <laughs> We're going to do a little blood transfusion on some of you. Some of you get a blood test and you're O negative. <laughs> you're going to leave here today. You're all going to be B positive or A positive. I, I promise you. We're going to do a little transfusion. 
Our commitment to God and our communication with God must be marked with gratitude. Thanksgiving to God is one step towards spiritual health. Only the truly thankful person can enjoy strong spiritual health. Gratitude is a choice that we make that affects our entire life, emotionally, physically, relationally, spiritually, financially. Every aspect of our life is, is, is connected to this attitude of whether or not we have gratitude. Luke chapter 12 says, when someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. There is not a nation on the face of this earth that has been as blessed as this nation. With all of our moaning, all of our complaining, all of our sorrow, all of our grief, all of our bickering, there is not a nation that is more blessed than this place. And if you don't believe that, go somewhere else. You'll want to come back after five days. You'll say, man, that's the land I want to go back to. Why do you think so many people are trying to get in here? I'm not making a political statement. I don't blame them. Someone brought me here. My parents moved here when I was 12. I came with them. Seemed like a good thing to do at 12. Listen, great gifts mean great responsibilities. Greater gifts mean greater responsibilities. You can't go around a sad sack. You, you've been given the joy of the Lord. You've been given this blessing that we have called America. You've been given all the blessings of the Lord. You can't go around this month with, oh, it's Thanksgiving. Oh, who's coming? Ain't Gladys? Oh, we got to put up with her again. I got to cook. How many people? <laughs> That's my introduction. Did you like it? <laughs> Here's my sermon. Oh, David, I love the psalmist, David. When you go home today, I don't have time to read the whole psalm. We're going to read some of Psalm 102. If you're old like me, you've got to go home and read it. He's an old man, and he's writing, and he says, My bones have melted within me. My heart is weak. But then he says this, write this down. Let this be recorded for generation to come. I love David. He's just like me. He had handouts. He had notes you could fill in. He didn't have an app on his phone, but he had little parchments. And he, he, when he said something, he said to people, listen, write this down. Don't just listen to it. Write this down. I say to you today, write this down. You got a bulletin. You got an app. Write this down. Circle it in your notes. I'm going to write this down. I'm not going to let it just be something I hear. Write this down. Let this be recorded for the generation to come. That a people yet to be created. Listen to this. A people not yet born will praise the Lord. When we write down what God has done for us, there's a generation. Listen, I want to bless my son. I want to bless my grandson, but by the eye of faith today, I see my great-grandchildren. I see people that I will never meet, and they will sing his praises because Papa wrote down his praises. We can affect generations to come when we get the right attitude. Tell them. So you got to write it down, and then you got to tell them. Here's what you tell them. Tell them the Lord looked down from his holy height, from his sanctuary, from heaven. The Lord gazed on the earth. He heard the sighing, the groans of the prisoner. He set those who were doomed to death. He opened the doors of their death cells and released them. So that people may declare the name of the Lord in Zion. And his praises were sung in Jerusalem. When the peoples all gathered together and the kingdoms, many rulers came to worship and to serve the Lord. In your bulletin, that words are printed there. I want you to underline one word for me. It's the word that. So that people may declare the name of the Lord in Zion. So that people may declare the name of the Lord in Zion. Uh, the word and the sentence structure changes based on the inflection and the tone you put on words. You understand this. The correct way to read that line is this. So that people may declare the name of the Lord in Zion. <laughs> Got it? He's talking about so that people, so, so because we do these things, people will be able to praise the Lord. I, I circled it in my Bible. I underlined it. I, I pronounce it. I say it a little differently. Here's how way I say it. So that people <laughs> may declare the name and the praises of the Lord. So that people, what people? That people. We are that people. We are that church. 
We are those that the Lord is called to say. We are that that got the that. <laughs> and we're going to share that with whoever will listen to us. We are that people. I am the child of the king. I am saved. I have been delivered. I want to talk to you today about gratitude for deliverance. Won't be long. Three observations. How long could it possibly take? I don't have much to talk about. I've already given you most of what I want to say. But I want you to write this down because I want you to have something to write down so you can tell your family about it. I'm going to make three observations from the psalm that David wrote. Don't panic. We'll start in the darkness and we'll start in a bad place. But you know that when you go to the doctor, you got to hear the truth. So we're going to start in the dark place. And my three observations are simply this this morning. Observation number one, I want to highlight, I want you to notice the extreme misery that these people and mankind are in. It says, he heard the sighing, the groans of the prisoner, those who were doomed to death. God looks down from heaven and he hears, he sees the sighing and the groaning. Listen, extreme misery, like we cannot even begin to comprehend. The word extreme means most violent, the worst, beyond which there is none other. This extreme misery. Listen, without God, we are doomed. Without Christ, we are bound by our sins. We are gripped by the misery of a future that is futile, a, a, an existence without hope, a, a life that at best we can kind of struggle through and at 80 or 90 years old breathe out our last breath and we will usher in an eternity that is lost and doomed. The Bible says without God, without Christ, we enter into a place called hell. Yeah, we still preach about it in this church. It's a frightening place. It's a place of doom and sorrow. The Bible says it's a place of gnashing of teeth and screamings of fear. The Bible says hell hath enlarged itself. Almost every person you run into in life without Christ is doomed to extreme misery for all of eternity. They will be separated from God. They will be in torment. There will be no hope. There will be no escape. It's not a place you go to temporarily. Sorry, all you former Catholics. How many of you are former Catholics? Don't be shy. Raise your Look, look. Wow. What are you doing here? I'm sorry to shake you up and I'm sorry to freak you out, but I don't know who told you, but it's just not in the Bible. There's no landing place. There is no purgatory. The Bible says, if I know the Lord, to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. If I die today, and I'm not planning on it, but if I die today, I know this. I'm going straight into glory. I'm going to see Jesus' face. He's going to open up those pearly gates. Woo! There's no test. There's no exam. I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. This boy ain't going to heaven. I'm uh, going to hell. I'm going to heaven. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! Now watch what I mean about offending people and getting in trouble. You really watch it. <laughs> Just for fun, put this on Facebook this week. I want you to notice this. <laughs> Heaven has a wall, has gates, and has an immigration program. <laughs> Hell has no gates, no walls, and anybody who wants to can go there. All you got to do is reject Christ. The Bible says hell hath enlarged itself. Not everybody gets to go to heaven. I I'm, I'm sorry to freak you out. Not everybody gets in. Unless you accept Christ, you are doomed for extreme misery. And I want to frighten you today. I do. I, I, every time I preach on hell, someone say, Pastor, you're scaring people. Good. I want to scare the hell out of you. That's what I want to do. You're on your way to hell without Christ. I don't want you to go there. It's a place of eternal torment. The Bible says there's a man in the New Testament that speaks up out of Gehenna, out of hell. And he says, just send somebody to dip their finger in water and just let them put just that little drip on my tongue. And, and, and the, the prophet says, we can't. There's a great gulf between. I can't. And he says, okay, well, then at least go tell my brothers to serve the Christ. Because I don't want him to end up in this misery with me. It's amazing when people get to hell, the concern they have for other people's souls. Let's not wait till we get there. Let's have concern now for people's souls. 
And never mind eternity, just life in general. Listen, the sorrow that sin causes, the solitude it creates, the remorse, the regret, the brokenness of life, the shattered dreams and family dysfunction, the degradation, the damage, the despair, the depression caused by our failures is sometimes overwhelming. When I think of what sin has caused in my life and in the lives of people that I've loved, the wasted years, the foolishness, the broken dreams, why? Because I was in sin and I was in extreme misery. Jesus in the New Testament enters the temple and they hand him the Torah, the Old Testament scroll. It's the custom for someone to stand and read it and they unroll it for him and he reads from the book of Isaiah. It's recorded in Luke's gospel. It says this, Jesus speaks these words from Isaiah. He says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor, to the humble and afflicted. He has sent me to announce release to the captives, pardon and forgiveness to the blind. Forgiveness, rather, to bind up the wounds of the brokenhearted and recovery of sight to the blind. To set free those who are oppressed, downtrodden, bruised, crushed by tragedy. To proclaim release from confinement and condemnation. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, the day when salvation and the favor of God will abound greatly. We got lots to be thankful for today, church. But I don't want you to forget the extreme misery that God has delivered us from. So, can I give you a word of encouragement today like only Pastor Mark can? Whenever you read this, I want you to hear it in this voice. (laughs) Shut up. Stop moaning. Stop complaining. Stop groaning. A moment of gratitude makes a monumental difference in our attitude. I'm not... I can't believe I've got this problem. My car broke. I'm not going to hell. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I've escaped damnation. I've escaped God's wrath. Woo! I got to be thankful. Amen? There is no better exercise for your own soul, for the strength of your own heart, than reaching down in non judgmental love and lifting people up. You say, what's that quote got to do with what you're saying? Uh, Here's what I also don't want you to forget. I don't want you to forget the extreme misery that God rescued us from when you run into people who are still in that extreme misery. Don't be judgmental. Don't be harsh. Don't be condemning. Don't tell them, you're a sinner. You know, you're going to hell. Just tell them, I know a way out. I know a man. Whoo! I know a man, and he's got all the answers. His name is Jesus. Don't, don't, Don't be judgmental. Be loving when you reach out to these people. Extreme misery. Oh, I left out a slide. I don't know if you can find it or not. It doesn't matter. Right before the scripture, that's a great slide. Listen, misery is a communicable disease. It loves company. Misery is a communicable disease. It it loves company. Don't be miserable. Be joy-filled. Amen? Extreme misery. The psalmist says... God saw our extreme misery. Now, now, now we shall begin our upward climb. Just got two more points and you'll be out on time. Did that rhyme? I didn't mean it to. Uh, We shall begin to take a little step of hope here. Ready? So my first observation is extreme misery. My second observation is observed misery. Observed misery. It says, tell them, tell them, tell somebody. Tell somebody, hey, tell somebody, tell your neighbor. (laughs) I love, I love David. He said, take notes, and he said, turn, tell the person next to you. He said, tell somebody, the Lord has looked down from his holy height, from his sanctuary. From heaven, the Lord has gazed upon the earth. Have you ever seen an animal in distress? I was watching some videos yesterday with my grandson. Uh, We were, he loves that little iPad thing, he calls it his meep, his my pad. I think somebody ought to market that or brand that or something or other. I I tell him, no, Brody, that's an iPad. He goes, no, Papa, it's not yours. It's mine. (laughs) Makes perfect sense if you're six, I guess, you know. Uh, He says, Papa, can I go on on, on my MyPad? I I said, it's not a MyPad. It's an iPad. No, it's mine. It's a MyPad. (laughs) So, okay, let's go on to MyPad. So we started looking at animals caught, and and he loves to watch sharks on on the beach, and they You know, and we watched one yesterday of a guy scuba diving and a dolphin actually comes up in the wild. This is not like a sea world. In the wild, a dolphin comes up and actually nudges a diver and then turns around and shows him his flipper. And the flipper's got all wire around it and a big fish hook in it. 
He's underwater. His buddy's filming it. And the flipper, he turns like this, and, and so he gets the fish hook out, and then he's trying to get the wire off, and he can't get it off, you know. And then he pulls out a pair of scissors, so the dolphin backs away because he pulls out these scissors. And then the dolphin, like, swims around him, and then the dolphin comes back like this and lifts his flipper. And, and he cuts it off like this. And my grandson's like, Papa, I want to do that. <laughs> I said, well, son, if you grew up to be a preacher, you can go to church every Sunday, and you can help people cut wires off their life. You can help people cut the ropes off and the things that hold them back. He looked at me and he said, I don't want to do that. I want to go under the water <laughs> and I want to do this. So, so he don't care about you. Brody don't care about you. You can all go to hell as far as Brody's concerned. He ain't cutting any of you loose. <laughs> I, I have some bird feeders on my property and I got one of those ones that's like a little cage and in it you put some suet, you know, you put, and, and the, the woodpeckers, they go in there. And, and it was out there a day, and I'm, I'm looking out there with my binoculars. I'm watching the different birds that come. I got nothing to do all day. This is what entertains me. And, and I'm looking at the different kind of birds that are coming and the different things you're taking, and I'm, I'm having fun watching them there. And all of a sudden, I look at this little thing. I'm like, something's moving in there. So I got up, I walked outside, and I went outside, and here was a bird, uh, not a woodpecker, but here's a bird that had gotten in there to get to sue it, but now he's trapped in there. And so Brody was over. I said, Brody, come on, come on, we're going to come out, you know. So we got, he, Brody was like, I'll get a stick. I was like, we don't need a stick. It's a bird. It's okay, man. It's not going to do anything, you know. Then the thing bit me. I was like, no, it didn't. <laughs> but I, I opened that cage up, you know, and I had to put my hand in there and turn him around and then show him the way out because birds are stupid. <laughs> of course they are. He got in there. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> and, and, and so I had to turn him around like that, and I got him out by the door, and, pfft, and then he flew away like that. It's a great feeling, isn't it? When, when you, <laughs> some of you get in the picture. Listen, the original in the Hebrew, when it says that from his holy heights, in the Hebrew, it literally means this, that God is on his throne. So he's on his throne, okay, and we're down here on earth. It literally means this, that God gets up and he peers down like this. What you doing down there? He observed our misery. He could have looked the other way. Could have said, well, serve your right. I gave you Ten Commandments. You wouldn't listen to me. I sent my son to die for you, and you're stupid. You wouldn't even. It says, but the prisoners are crying, and they're groaning, and God looks down. Who's that in trouble now? And when he sees us, listen, God is never blind to our tears, never deaf to our prayers, and never silent to our pain. He hears he will deliver us. Don't let your trials blow you over. Lean in and let them lift you up in new heights in Christ. Listen, over and over we are reminded and encouraged in Scripture that God sees us, that he will not abandon us. I put it in your notes for you. I put it in the, uh, on the screen. I, I put it in the app for you. All those Scriptures in the Psalms and in Jeremiah, you could read them. Over and over God says he hears, he answers. Uh, think of it. A God who is omniscient, all-knowing, turns his gaze in our broken direction, and he sees just us. And then he begins to plot and to plan over our lives, searching out the source of our sorrow and our misery, the ramifications of our grief, and then he actually prescribes an antidote to heal our wounds and deliver us from our distress. Because he sees us. Listen to me, broken mother, heartbroken dad. He's heard your groaning. He's heard your cry. Person going through pain right now in the midst of a divorce. Everything seems smashed and broken. God hears your cry. And he has actually observed. Extreme misery. Observed misery. Thirdly and finally, relieved misery. I know there's another blank. I'll give it to you. Relax. Relieved misery. Tell them the Lord looked down from his holy height. He set free those who were doomed to death. He opened the doors of their death cells, and he released them. Woo! Hallelujah. We are free today because of what God has done for us. So there was extreme misery. It was an observed misery. Now it's relieved misery. The Bible says in John 8, it says, So if the Son makes you free, then you are unquestionably free. Spurgeon said, sin and hell are married unless repentance proclaims the divorce. <laughs> our, our, we have no hope, but if we repent, we have all hope. Yeah. Amen? Right. 
And so to lead into my final point, I want to read one slide, and then I just want to actually play something for you. It's corny, but I love it, so listen to me. Here's the slide. Take your phone out. The antidote to misery, to all mental darkness, to the enslaving pattern of sin and sorrow is worship. We need worship, weeping worship, wonder-filled worship. When we begin to sense God's greatness and find ourselves transformed by it, renewed by it, released by it, revived by it, reaffirmed by it, reconciled by it, this is the antidote to our misery, to our overwhelming mental darkness. He is the answer. How do we find him? Through worship. I was in my office when I wrote that slide, and you'll forgive me, because the moment I wrote it, an, an old song clicked into my head. And I'm so old school, all you new, hip, young people. I, I'm going to play a song for you. Some of you know it. If you know it, sing along. Even if you don't know it, watch the words, think about the words, and begin to thank him for your freedom, your deliverance from your extreme misery. Would you just watch it, and I'll come back, we'll be done. Just, just watch this. <laughs> It's an old song. I know it. I know some of you are saying, man, I never heard that before. The words are incredible. Yeah. Friend, there was an extreme misery. There was an observed misery. There was a relieved misery. Right down the last blank, I'll let you go home. There should be audacious gratitude. Yeah. So the people, so that people may declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praises. I like this word, audacious. It means bold, impertinent despising restraint. I will not be silent. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm not afraid to tell people, man, I'm happy because I got the joy of the Lord. Final slide. 
You cannot, you cannot keep a man quiet if he has been spiritually in prison and has been brought out by God. If he has been condemned to die and has had his sentence canceled at the last moment, you cannot make him hold his tongue. You may tell him that he must keep his religion to himself, but it will be impossible. He is so overjoyed about it. It has so transformed him that he must begin to tell somebody about it, to act on it in some way, to seek to repay in some way. Why? Because gratitude generates generosity. I can't be silent. I can't be grumpy. I can't be miserable like everybody else. I was lost, and now I'm found. I was blind, and now I see. I had no hope, and now I have hope. Father, would you help us today to take this simple message? God, would you help us to remember where we came from? Help us to remember the extreme misery that our lives were embroiled in. We were wrapped up by our sin and in our sin. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us and rescued us. God, would you help us to grab a hold of this truth and just see how far you've brought us so that we might be a people that learns to express our gratitude because expressed gratitude changes us and the people around us. So help us, Father. 